My name is Joe Paschal. I'm an Extension Livestock Specialist based in Corpus Christi, Texas. I work for the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the, I'm a member of the Texas A&M Animal Science Department. Today what we're going to talk about is toxic weeds. I work in an area that essentially runs in a line from Beaumont to College Station to Del Rio in South New Mexico. And today we're going to talk about a toxic weed that has certainly infested all that area as well as most of Texas and the southern United States. And that toxic weed today is going to is silverleaf nightshade. Silverleaf nightshade is a upright growing green perennial plant. It's a weed. Typically we start seeing it in March in South Texas as a very small plant. Uh, right now this is mid-June and this will kind of give you an idea how tall this plant can grow from anywhere a foot to two feet. In some areas it can be as tall as three feet. You can see that it has a single stem with several branches that come out. They call it silver leaf because if you look at the leaves, typically they have very fine hairs that cover them. And then on the flip side of the leaf, it looks a little bit lighter colored, almost silver. Now there's another hairy plant that's often confused with silver leaf nightshade in the croton family, both Texas croton and woolly croton. Often those are called goat weed, but they're distinctively different. If you look at this leaf, it's very elongated and comes to a point and it's somewhat wavy in terms of its shape. So it's a very long leaf and they're alternate leaves. So you can see that a leaf comes out on the stem here and the leaf comes out on the stem here. The other thing that makes this plant easily recognizable is the flower. The flowers are either deep purple or violet, although sometimes they can be white with bright yellow stamens. So this is a very young plant, a relatively young plant, and the flower is very purple, whereas this is a little bit older plant, and you can see that the color has faded. But both of these are, are toxic. The toxic principle in this plant is called solenum, and it is an it's a, it's a cholinesterase inhibitor, which means that it affects the nervous system of the individual. So it's found throughout the entire plant, uh, but it's most concentrated in the seeds. So as the flowers drop off, you can see that the seed pods start to form. And so here is a, a very early immature seed pod. Then here's one that's a little bit further along. And then if we look further in this plant, we can see some that are much more completely developed, such as this one. And you can see it sort of looks like an unripe tomato. And that's because this plant is a member of those families, the tomato and the potato plant. And so it's relatively light green with some dark streaks in it. As it is developing, when it becomes mature, it becomes a bright yellow, almost the same color as this flower stamen. And then as it ages, it becomes dark, purple or even brown and that's important to realize because as animals graze this plant as animals graze this plant you may actually see the residue of the seeds in the rumen contents of either the animals that have been that, that have died or that you're collecting contents on so the the plant itself uh, can be, it, it, it's generally, if it is grazed, it's grazed by animals that are looking for something to eat. So certainly not like we see behind me, there's plenty of grass for these animals to eat. But if you look, we're actually standing on a roadside in front of a pasture. You see a lot of the plants that are scattered along the roadside. And so these are scattered by mowing and by wind. Wildlife will actually eat these plants and won't, it won't have an effect on them. When the plants are relatively young like this, at the very top of these leaves is very high in protein and so oftentimes ruminants will graze them if they don't have anything else to eat. And so the problem with that is that it doesn't take very much plant in order to cause toxicity. Most of the reports show toxicity at about one-tenth to three-tenths of a percent of body weight. So that's only about one pound or three pounds of consumption of this plant by a thousand pound animal. 
Lots of times we'll see these plants scattered in pastures like you see behind me. Other times you'll see them in hay fields. Anywhere that you see disturbed areas or heavily grazed areas, because these seeds are light activated, you'll see the plant. And that's why we see a lot along the roadsides and they get spread. Good news is that these plants are relatively easy to kill. Okay, as a broadleaf plant, uh, they can be sprayed. Uh, it's better to spray them when they're this size than when they're this size. And actually you should spray them before they actually start forming a leaf and a seed head. And so there's a lot of good spraying recommendations, but in nearly any broadleaf killer will take care of these plants. What you need to be concerned about is that if you do spray the plants to kill them, it does make these plants much more palatable. And so as a result, if you do not remove livestock, uh, that they will consume these plants and then you compound your problem. So horses, cattle, sheep and goats, even humans can be poisoned by the solanum by consuming parts of this plant. Sheep and goats tend to be a little bit more resistant to the poison, all right? But, uh, and, and there's been actually a report that horses that have consumed, have been consuming this plant and treated with, a, with the anthelmintic ivermectin uh, have died within two days of treatment because the ivermectin actually passes across the blood-brain barrier and into the brain and kills the horses. Most of the time as a cholinesterase inhibitor, what we see symptoms in livestock is we start to see excess of salivation. We start to see some diarrhea because it affects the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. We start to see increased respiration, muscle tremors, uh, inability to stand, weakness and gait, and then the animal lays down and is unable to get up. And then of course in extreme cases, in most cases of High levels of ingestion of this plant will see death of the animal. Silverleaf nightshade is not just responsible for, for producing a cholinesterase inhibitor, an alkaloid, but has also been implicated in nitrate toxicity. In areas that it will grow that have been heavily fertilized, like perhaps a hay field with nitrogen fertilizer, or underneath a shade tree where cattle like to congregate and is heavily manured, you will see silverleaf nightshade accumulate nitrogen and when ingested can cause nitrate toxicity in ruminants, in sheep and goats and horses, and not horses, but sheep and goats and, and cattle, excuse me. So it's got more than one role to play in terms of a, a poisonous plant for livestock. As far as treatment, uh, the best way is to avoid animals eating it. So if you have an overgrazed pasture that has a lot of this in it, you need to remove the livestock and treat it and make sure that the, that the plant decomposes thoroughly before animals are brought back in. If you buy hay, either square bales or round bales uh, that have this plant in it or plant parts in it, uh, you need to remove those plant parts before you feed them. I understand that that can be difficult in round bales but in square bales it's very important particularly if you're going to feed this to smaller small ruminants or or to or to horses and so the best way to do it is to not purchase the product that has this in it so sort of in conclusion or in summary now this is silver leaf nightshade it's a perennial plant it's a green plant that grows nearly anywhere in texas uh, it's it's toxic to almost all livestock it's, it's at some level, at a relatively low level of one-tenth to three-tenths of a percent of body weight. But it is very easy to kill, very easy to identify and to use management practices to avoid it.